The bad news is I'm back. So uh, thanks to Indira for coming and filling in for me, and also thanks to my TA sitting back in the back for helping with the camera. So everything worked. I was very happy, and um, that's very good. So we are uh, moving forward talking about signaling. And one of the things that I think you'll see in signaling is that, A, it's a very important process, but B, at the level that we're looking at signaling, it's a lot of this goes to this, goes to this, goes to this, goes to this. And so commonly the questions are, well, do I have to know this goes to this, goes to this, goes to this, goes to this? And the answer is generally yes. Okay? I'm sorry. Uh, that I, I don't like memor memorizing something solely for the sake of memorizing things, but we are covering very important signaling pathways. And these are really very, very um, critical for cells to function properly. And so I think that there is um, some value in your understanding what that signal goes to here, goes to there, goes to there, um, is all about. OK. Um, so when Indira finished last time, uh, she was talking about angiotensin. And angiotensin um, is a uh, peptide hormone. She, I don't think she mentioned that. Uh, a peptide hormone is a protein that acts like a hormone. So there are numerous examples of peptide hormones. Angiotensin is one of them. Um, another is um, insulin. Another is epidermal growth factor, uh, both of which, or all three of which, we'll talk about uh, today. She got started uh, talking about the um, um, angiotensin um, situation, so I want to pick up where she left off. Angiotensin um, binds to a receptor in the cell membrane that is a 7TM. And that 7TM um, has, um, uh, it interacts with the G protein, which uh, causes some things to happen. So it's a different scheme than we saw with the beta adrenergic receptor, but it does involve a G protein. It's a different G protein, but it's non nonetheless, it involves a G protein. And that G protein becomes activated just like the G protein did in the beta adrenergic receptor, meaning that. Uh, the shape change that results from the binding of the hormone causes the GTP to be loaded onto the G protein and GDP to be released, okay, which activates the G protein. The G protein then goes and activates an enzyme that is uh, what makes the, the uh, signal. This, this is very similar to what happened in the beta adrenergic receptor. In the beta adrenergic receptor, it activated a G protein that then uh, the G, they activated G protein, then went and activated adenylate cyclase that made a second messenger. In this case, the enzyme that's being activated is not adenylate cyclase, but instead it's an enzyme known as phospholipase C. Okay? Phospholipase C. You can see it here on the screen. Phospholipase C catalyzes a reaction that breaks down a component of membranes. It breaks down a component of membranes. So membranes have what we call a lipid bilayer. And we'll talk more about lipid bilayer actually next term. But the lipid bilayer has molecules in it that look something like what you see on the top here. This top molecule is called phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate, which you probably won't memorize. But you should know it as PIP2. I think PIP2 is a reasonable thing to know. PIP2 has long tails, okay, those are long fatty acid chains that are sticking off of it at one end. And at the other end, it has this inositol, which is what this ring structure is up here, an inositol phosphate structure that, that we will see, okay? What the enzyme is doing is it's breaking the bond between the phosphate and this, this component over here. This component over here is known as diacylglycerol after that bond is broken. So this is called DAG, D-A-G diacylglycerol. And the piece that's released is called IP3. Please turn that you know what thing off. OK. Um, it turns out that both of these guys are second messengers. Both of them. All right. So in the case of adenylate cyclase, we made one second messenger, which was cyclic AMP. Here, we've taken a molecule that is not a second messenger. We split it into two pieces. And these two pieces are each acting as second messengers. Now, second messengers, you recall, are molecules that are inside of the cell that cause the cell to have a response. And we'll see what that response is in just a little bit. Okay? So 
These guys are both acting as second messengers. Well, let's see how they actually work uh, inside of the cell. This schematically depicts what I've just described to you from the, the, the uh, point of phospholipase C action. So here's phospholipase C coming in, and it sees one of these molecules that has the DAG attached to the um, PIP3, and it breaks the bond between the two, and I'm sorry, PIP2, and uh, releases the IP3, and it releases DAG. Well, notice what happens here. DAG still has those long nonpolar tails, and those lo long nonpolar tails are very happy in the environments of the cell membrane. So DAG stays associated with the cell membrane, and it comes into play later. The IP3, however, is very water soluble. It's full of phosphate. So it's very charged, and it doesn't want to stay associated with the membrane. Instead, it goes down and it binds to a receptor that's found in the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay? So here's a receptor in the endoplasmic reticulum. And when it binds to that receptor, it causes the receptor to open up a channel. Opens up a channel. So a channel is just basically a hole. And when that hole is opened up in this receptor, all of the calcium that was in the endoplasmic reticulum comes squirting out. Why is the calcium there? Well, calcium, as I've mentioned before, is a, an ion that is very problematic for the cell. Okay? You get too much calcium in the cell, and you precipitate your DNA. That's not a good career move. Okay? So cells have to sequester calcium into little chambers, and one of these chambers is the endoplasmic reticulum. That means that when it does that, that the concentration of the uh, calcium inside of the uh, endoplasmic reticulum is higher than the concentration of calcium in the cytoplasm. So that if we open up a channel, what's going to happen? The, cal the calcium is going to start leaking out because it goes from high concentration to low concentration. And that's what's happening here. Why do I tell you that? Well, it turns out that calcium is the equivalent of what I call a third messenger. You can call it a second. In fact, most people call it a second messenger. I tend to call it a third. I'll take either second or third. I don't care. But the point is that calcium now comes out into the cytoplasm, not in concentrations that will cause precipitation. Okay. This is fairly tightly managed. It's not going to cause the DNA to precipitate in the small amount that comes out. But that small amount comes out, and it will interact with a, a protein, uh, an enzyme called protein kinase C. That's different from protein kinase A. After you work with this stuff, you realize that the cell is full of protein kinases. We're going to talk about some more of them later today. Okay? Protein kinase C is activated by two things. Calcium and DAG. And you'll notice where it's located. It's located up at the cell membrane where it can interact with DAG. The combination of these two things cause protein kinase C to become activated. And protein kinase C will then start phosphorylating proteins, just like we talked about protein kinase A will phosphorylate proteins. And these phosphorylated proteins then can go on and do a variety of things. They'll either be activated or inactivated, depending upon the individual protein that gets phosphorylated. And these responses can result in things that result in what angiotensin is trying to do. Angiotensin helps to regulate our blood pressure. Okay? One of the ways in which we can regulate our blood pressure is by the smooth muscles that are around our arteries and veins. Making them contract will help to control blood pressure. And guess what causes muscles to contract? Calcium. So this is a really beautiful system. Everything is working together. Everything is coordinated together to bring about the cellular response. Okay? Now there's more to it than just simply the contraction of the, blood, of the muscles because protein kinase C is phosphoxinite. 
Protein kinase C is phosphorylating some things. It's also going to affect uh, other processes inside of the cell. Pretty cool. Questions about that? Yes? Do calcium and DAG stimulate the same protein kinase or different ones? They stimulate the, both of them stimulate protein kinase C, the same one. Yep. Yes, sir, Omar. Yes, they ha his question is, do they have to do it together? The answer is yes, they do. So these two work in concert to activate protein kinase C. OK, so that's how the angiotensin system works. There are many, many um, 7TMs in the cell and many, many different G proteins in the cell as well. So we're talking about a couple of them here. All right. Well, I've told you that calcium is a bit problematic for cells, so cells don't want to have too much of it freely floating around. All right? And consequently, one of the ways in which they manage calcium in, inside of their cytoplasm is, I, I mentioned first of all, that they can move it and sequester it into an organelle like in the endoplasmic reticulum. Another way they can manage it is by having calcium binding proteins. Okay? Calcium binding proteins. There's a variety of proteins um, that bind calcium, and they all have a common structure known as an EF hand. An EF hand. The EF hand is depicted here because, and here's the structure on the left, here's a comparison of a hand. And it doesn't take too much imagination to see the parallel between the two. The calcium fits nicely in this little pocket in the hand just like it fits very nicely in this little pocket inside of this calcium binding protein. Okay? That has the effect of reducing the concentration of calcium inside of the cell. It also has the effect of changing the shape of the protein that has bound it. When we think about how a protein's shape has changed, you guys can start to see the patterns of what happens. We can change what that protein does. So if this calcium binding protein, let's say, interacts with another protein, it might interact only when calcium is bound, because only then does it have the right structure. And that's a very common phenomenon. A common calcium binding protein is known as calmodulin. Okay? Calmodulin. You can see it right there on the screen. Calmodulin is a calcium binding protein. It has an EF hand structure. And by the way, the EF hand is just the name of the structure, not the name of the protein. It's the name of the structure within the protein. Okay? And here we can see what's happened to calcium, I'm sorry, to calmodulin when it has no calcium compared to when it does have calcium. We see a structural change. We can actually see this thing sort of opening up. You see this bent down here without calcium. And when it's bound to calcium, you notice it now looks kind of like a C of some sort, right? Whereas here, it was kind of hard to tell what it was. That C is capable of binding something only in this configuration. In this configuration, it can't bind to this other protein. Now, the beauty of this is, like I said, we're reducing the concentration of calcium, but we're still getting the calcium effect. Calcium concentrations go up when, and when they go up, it gets bound by calmodulin, and calmodulin then goes and activates or inactivates other proteins. Okay? So this is a very uh, nice way of regulating the amount of calcium that's present inside of cells. This enzyme that's, that, that the calmodulin is binding to here is one of many. There are many, and we'll talk about one in particular later in the term, that calmodulin binds to only when it's got calcium. OK. Well, we have finished, uh, at this point, talking about the 7TMs. Okay? So 7TMs um, are one class of receptor protein that's found inside of cells. We're going to move our attention and talk about some other receptor proteins that are found inside of cells. And they are not 7TMs. Okay? The first of these is um, a protein known as the insulin receptor. Okay? Insulin, of course, is a hormone. It's a hormone that's released by our bodies in response to increasing concentrations of glucose. 
When we have a meal, our pancreas senses the fact that our glucose levels are rising. And because our body knows that glucose is a poison, it has to do something to deal with that poison, so the pancreas releases insulin, which causes cells to take up that poison. Seems like a strange way to deal with a poison. It's kind of like throwing yourself on a grenade, right? Well, it turns out cells have some very good uses for that glucose. They can use it for energy. They can also make glycogen out of it and use it for storage. So when insulin is released, glucose concentrations in the blood fall because cells are taking up all of that glucose. Well, what we're going to learn here is how that process occurs. How is it that cells take up that glucose? All right. Well, let's look at insulin first. Insulin is a fairly simple uh, uh, protein. It's not very large at all. It's held together by a couple of disulfide bonds. This chain that you see in blue is actually not linked to the chain in yellow by anything other than disulfide bonds. The disulfide bonds are right there and right there. So the two chains are held together only by disulfide bonds. Now, we're not focusing on insulin here. We're focusing on the receptor for insulin. So the receptor for insulin is found in the cell membrane. And it looks like this. It actually has two subunits, and these two subunits we call a dimer, D-I-M-E-R. And this dimer is interesting, okay? The dimer can exist in a couple of different configurations. I'll talk later about the uh, epidermal growth factor receptor, which can form as a dimer, but it doesn't normally. Insulin receptor starts out as a dimer. But its structure in the absence of insulin is different than its structure in the presence of insulin. Right? So what you see here is the receptor in the absence of insulin. The outside of the cell is on the top. The inside of the cell is on the bottom. When insulin gets released, it goes out and finds receptors. Okay? And when it finds receptors, It's not quite what I want. I have to describe it back here. Okay. When it finds a receptor, all right, something interesting happens. Okay. As I said, the insulin receptor can exist in two different configurations. One configuration without it and one with. When it's in the presence of the insulin receptor, the orientation of these beta subunits in the, on the inside of the cell is slightly changed slightly changed. Okay. Well, again, you know what slight changes mean. Slight changes mean changes in activity. This slight change in shape causes these two, these two subunits, enzymatic activities, to start working like crazy. Okay. It causes their enzymatic activities to start working like crazy. And what they do is they catalyze a reaction on each other. <clears throat> Excuse me. What's the reaction they catalyze? Well, this receptor is something we know as a tyrosine protein kinase. This is another protein kinase, but it's different than the ones we talked about before. This protein kinase puts phosphates onto tyrosine side chains. The kinase that we saw before that is the protein kinase A, the protein kinase C, they put phosphates onto serines and threonines. What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that phosphorylation of tyrosines in many cases plays roles in decisions of cells to divide or not divide. In this particular case, it's not, it's not doing that, but we'll see other examples where it does. This Tyrosine protein kinase is activated. The two subunits phosphorylate each other. And when they phosphorylate each other, it starts the signaling process. Here's the receptor. Here's the insulin bound. And here are these 
subunits that have phosphorylated the bijabers out of each other. And in the process of doing so, they have, they have um, created phosphotyrosines. That is a tyrosine with a phosphate on it. That's what a tyrosine protein kinase is going to do. Well, it turns out that phosphorylated tyrosines are targets for proteins that have a specific structure in them known as an SH2 domain. I'll repeat that. Tyrosine protein kinases, I'm sorry, no, this is not tyrosine protein kinases. Phosphorylated tyrosines are targets for proteins that have a specific structure in them. And that specific structure across many proteins is very similar. And it has a name. It's called an SH2 domain. Well, here's a phosphorylated tyrosine. Here is a protein called IRS1. It recognizes that phosphotyrosine by an SH2 domain, which is what's the binding here. Here's the SH2 domain. Here's the phosphotyrosine. And now this tail is brought in close proximity to the tyrosine protein kinase. And guess what happens? It gets phosphorylated. So now we have phosphotyrosines out here. And these phosphotyrosines are targets for SH2 domain of another protein, phosphoinositide 3 kinase. You like that name? OK. Phosphoinositide 3 kinase okay, will take the PIP2 that we saw before, and it will put an extra phosphate on it and make something called PIP3. It's a kinase. Again, a kinase is going to put a phosphate onto something. In this case, the kinase is putting a phosphate onto PIP2 in the membrane and creates PIP3. Okay? This, this is a long pathway. And you're not going to know all of it. Don't worry. You're just going to know what you see on the screen. All right? PIP3 is, a, is recognized by this protein over here known as PDK1 which has a longer name there. And PDK1 is also a protein kinase. You guys tired of protein kinases yet? This protein kinase activates another kinase known as AKT. And a whole chain of events happens. Now, I'm throwing that out there so that you don't have to uh, know all the other events that happen. Now, I promised I was, I was going to tell you how it was that insulin was causing the cell to take up glucose. We're getting close. Okay? This chain of events that comes out of here will result in a change in the trafficking inside of the cell. Trafficking. Okay? We think of drug trafficking. We think of the movement of drugs, right? When we think of cellular trafficking, we're modifying the movement of proteins within the cell. Cells, uh, sorry, proteins move within cells. They move on some very distinct routes. The change in trafficking that happens inside of the cell affects a protein known as a GLUT, G-L-U-T. It's not a GLUT, it's a GLUT. All right? A GLUT, and there are, there are numerous GLUTs, GLUTs, in this case, get moved from the cytoplasm of the cell to the membrane of the cell. And what does a GLUT do? A GLUT brings in glucose. I'm going to run through this whole thing with you again. Pretty convoluted pathway. We see signaling as most signaling pathways are like this. Many, many steps. And you wonder, why? Why so many steps? Why so varied? Is it just to make it difficult for biochemistry students? Well, no. It's there because we're following one particular thing that's happening inside of cells. If this guy branches off and affects something else, we can have one response causing many different things to happen inside of cells. So the more steps we have, the more branches we can have, and the more of a, of a tuned response the cell can have as a result. Okay, I promised I would go back through it. Let's go through it. I'm going to go through it fairly quickly. Oh, you like that, right? All right, insulin binds. 
beta subunits become active and phosphorylate tyrosines. The phosphotyrosines are targets for proteins with SH2 domains. The first one to bind is IRS1, which gets phosphates on its tyrosines, which is then bound by phosphoinositide 3 kinase. You notice there's no abbreviation for that. Would you guys like to have an abbreviation for that? Okay. I usually let the class name it. What would you like to name it? Bob? Okay. Bob is very easy. This is Bob from now on. Okay. Bob is an acceptable answer on the exam. Okay. Perfectly acceptable answer on the exam. It will not be an acceptable answer outside this class, but inside this class, <laughs> it will be an acceptable answer. Okay. Bob puts a phosphate onto PIP2 to make PIP3. PIP3 activates PDK1. PDK1 activates AKT. Then magic happens, and GLUT transport is affected. GLUT is moved to the cell surface. And now glucose is brought in, because that's what, glu what GLUT does. The result of this is insulin binding has caused a cell to take up, has caused a cell to take up glucose. Pretty cool. Question, questions about that? Was I that clear or are you that fatigued? Yes? IRS does get activated. These, pro these, phosphorylate these phosphorylations happen because of its proximity here to the beta subunit. Yes? Is this the process compromised in diabetes 2? No, actually in diabetes 2, uh, there's two main types of diabetes. Diabetes 1 is the uh, inability to make glucose. Diabetes 2 is, uh, is much more complicated. Uh, but one of the, one of the uh, hallmarks of diabetes 2 is the um, limited ability to respond to glucose. So what happens in people who have diabetes 2 is that their, their body may even be producing insulin in normal amounts, but the cells aren't responding to it properly. And so there's, there's, as I said, there's many manifestations of that, but the primary one is that. So what happens in people with diabetes 2 is their blood glucose levels goes high, then the cell really dumps out a bunch of glucose, I mean, it dumps out a bunch of insulin, which now over causes the cell to take up more glucose, and blood glucose concentrations go up, down, up, down. And people with diabetes may oftentimes not only be hyperglycemic, when they get that burst of insulin, they may become hypoglycemic as well. So it's a very challenging uh, balance that we have to talk about. And I'll talk about that more actually when I talk about um, metabolism of glucose later. So, so I'll save that for then. OK? OK, that's pretty cool. I told you, this goes to this, goes to this, goes to this. Here's the SH2 domain for what that's worth. There's a phosphotyrosine. And you'll see there's some arginines that are very nicely placed to uh, arginines, of course, have positively charged, charged side chains. And they're attracted to the negative of the phosphate on the phosphotyrosine. Yes? Um, his question was, any place that there's a phosphorylation I showed in the previous slide, is, that an SH, is it bound by an SH2 domain? Um, potentially, yes. And I'm simplifying a bit. So there are things that get phosphorylated that aren't necessarily targets for SH2 domains. But for our purposes, we will say they are. OK? There's another one called an SH3 domain that is recognizing a different structure. But we won't, we won't go into that here. OK. Let's see. So. Um, we don't need to talk about that. And you can see here's what we went through. And then we got down here to um, um, PIP3. And then there's activated AKT. And then you'll see several steps. So you, and we mercifully omitted those steps from you uh, from this so that you recognize that what has to happen is that glucose transporters move to the cell surface. And that's the bottom line of what's happening. OK. Well, let's talk about another um, interesting membrane receptor. And this membrane receptor binds to another peptide hormone known as EGF, 
or epidermal growth factor. Now this one we will see plays some very important roles in cell division and we will see how it being screwed up can result in cancer. Okay? So epidermal growth factor is a um, peptide hormone. It binds to its own receptor, that is an epidermal growth factor receptor. And what it does, it stimulates a series of events to happen that result in cell division. A growth factor favors cell division. Okay? We're going to see how that happens. Okay. Now, here, that's a, that's a schematic, I don't want that. Here is a depiction of the process that happens when epidermal growth factor binds to its receptor. All right? Now, epidermal growth factor is different from the insulin receptor. It has some similarities, but it starts out differently. How does it start out differently? Well, the insulin receptor started out as a dimer and had a slight shape change. The epidermal growth factor in the, I'm sorry, the epidermal growth factor receptor in the absence of epidermal growth factor is always a monomer. They're not paired up like you see here. Instead, we would only have, if there were no EGF, we would have the receptor over here by itself, we'd have this other receptor over here by itself. They would not be linked as they are here. The binding of EGF causes a structural change in the receptor to the point where it will now interact with another receptor that has also bound to EGF. That creates the structure that you see on the screen. You notice these sort of interlinking little loops here. That's, that's necessary for the receptor to dimerize, that is to make two copies next to each other. All right, so it starts out differently than the insulin receptor. But after that, it looks very similar. Now these two beta subunits are brought into close proximity. And just like we saw with the insulin receptor, they're both tyrosine protein kinases. They both phosphorylate each other. And we see this tail of phosphotyrosines sticking off. The SH2 domain uh, of a protein called GERB2 binds to the phosphotyrosine here. GERB2 has some other binding domains for a protein called SOS. And SOS interacts with a protein called RAS, R-A-S. So we see in this case a sort of a complex structure that is built as a result of the dimerization and phosphorylation. There's only one phosphorylation that's ha or one set of phosphorylations that's happening here. Not like what we saw in the other one. We had different protein kinases. Yes? So GERB2 is a protein that is separate from SOS. They're separate distinct proteins. Yes, sir? Is SOS a G protein? It is not a G protein, but you're getting close, and I'll, I'll say something about that in a second. Okay? So SOS, we can think of these guys as basically docking stations for each other. GERB2 is a docking station for SOS. SOS is a docking station for RAS. And RAS, we're going to see, is what does the heavy lifting here. OK. Now, the question over here was, is this a G protein? Because this sure looks like a G protein. Well, RAS turns out to be a kind of a G protein. SOS is not, RAS is. When this docking occurs right here, it's the equivalent to the beta adrenergic receptor getting activated. A shape change causes the G protein to replace its GDP with GTP. RAS, therefore, gains a GTP. RAS is activated at that point. And RAS goes, and there's a big, long pathway that RAS will activate that, again, we're not going to talk about. But the net result of which is cell division will be stimulated. As a result of EGF binding, all this big apparatus is set up 
RAS gets activated, cell division gets stimulated. Now, when Indira talked about G-proteins, she told you a very, very important feature of G-proteins. And that was they bind GTP, but they also have the ability to turn themselves off. How do they do that? They hydrolyze GTP. So G-proteins and RAS are what we call bad enzymes. Bad meaning inefficient. This RAS may hold on to this GTP for a, for a few minutes before it actually hydrolyzes that GTP. That's not what we want out of an enzyme. Then we saw enzymes that made a million molecules of product in a second. Here's something that's binding a substrate and keeping it for a few minutes. What's the deal? Well, if it was a good enzyme, it would break down the GTP immediately and there would be no signal. The fact that it's a bad enzyme, or that is an inefficient enzyme, means that it is on long enough to pass on its signal to the next protein in the pathway. That's all fine and dandy, except when we have a mutation. Okay? RAS, is one, RAS is an example of a protein that we call an oncogene. Specifically, it's a proto-oncogene. A proto-oncogene is an unmutated form of a protein. And yes, this is a definition. A proto-oncogene is an unmutated form of a protein that plays an important role in controlling cells. That's what a proto-oncogene is. If I screw up the function of the proto-oncogene, I will create something called an oncogene. And that oncogene is a protein that will cause uncontrolled growth of a cell. So proto-oncogenes are perfectly normal. where You have plenty of RAS in your body. If you screw up RAS, and I'll tell you how you can do that, if you screw up RAS, you will potentially create a cell that will divide uncontrollably. How do you screw up RAS? You screw it up with a specific mutation. Okay. There's a glycine at position number 11 in the protein, and no, you don't need to know that. But you do need to know that if I make a mutation at a, this critical place inside of RAS, I destroy the ability of RAS to break down GTP. Uh-oh. I got problems. Because if this RAS can't break down GTP, what's it going to do? It's going to tell the cell continuously to divide, 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 divide. The only thing that's keeping it from dividing and dividing and dividing and dividing is the fact that it normally turns itself off. One mutation, one single mutation can cause that, that RAS to become an oncogene. Okay. What's the chance that's going to happen in a genome of 3 billion base pairs? Pretty small, right? <clears throat> How many cells do you have in your body? 15 trillion or so? Okay. If you had one mutation for every 15 trillion, shall we say, divisions, what would you have? You'd have, you'd have mutated RAS. Now you see why people worry about environmental carcinogens. A carcinogen favors mutation. It's going to increase the level of mutation. The more you mutate, the more likely you're going to activate an oncogene to cause a cell to divide uncontrollably. Not a good career move. Yes? Okay, so her question, I'm not going to answer, address it directly, but her question is basically if RAS uh, mutates, is there anything that can counteract that? The answer is yes, there is. Okay? 
So it's not a doomsday that when you make this one mutation, you're going to die tomorrow. All right? To form a tumor, there's many steps that's involved in forming a tumor. We don't know all the steps. We don't know the process. But yes, there are many counterbalances to preventing this from happening. But you can rest assured that there are many, many cancers that are out there that arise because of this mutation. Okay. All right. Other questions? Okay. Well, EGF is a really interesting receptor. And I've got to tell you some other things about EGF receptor. Okay. We could think, well, okay, so if we mutate RAS, we could have an oncogene. What if we um, mutated the EGF receptor? Would we have an oncogene? Well, we can imagine a scenario where that might happen. What if the EGF receptor, for example, started phosphorylating itself in the absence of EGF? Maybe a mutation EGF caused them to dimerize more commonly. And so this signal gets activated a lot more than it would otherwise. And you might have a tumor. The answer is yes, you might. EGF receptor is also a proto-oncogene. What if I had a mutation that made too much EGF itself? Would I have a problem? Yep. Yep. OK. So we see that any of these control mechanisms, that if we mess with them, we may, in fact, cause cells to become dividing uncontrollably. The coolest one I can tell you about is a related protein to the EGF receptor. Okay? It's called HER, H-E-R. All right? HER. HER turns out to look very much like the EGF receptor. And it's normally present in cells in relatively low amounts in their membranes. And HER can bind to the EGF receptor in the absence of EGF and cause this process to happen. And at a low level, this is going on all the time. It might be a normal part of cellular division. Okay? At a low level, HER is binding to the EGF receptor, stimulating this process in the absence of EGF. And that's happening at a low level inside of your cells at any given time. Well, what if we had a mutation that changed how much HER was being made? Would that be a problem? Well, the answer to all these has been yes. And the answer to this one is yes. Because now, instead of this happening at a low level of making this go on, all these extra HERs that are out there are grabbing a hold of every EGF receptor they can find and favoring this activation of RAS and favoring cell division. HER is also a proto-oncogene. Now, that's the bad news. The good news is there's a pretty good treatment for it. HER has been implicated in breast cancer, okay, among others. But it's been implicated in breast cancer. It turns out that if you can block the action of HER, you can stop this process from happening. So there's a, a, a specific antibody known as a monoclonal antibody that's been made that binds only to HER and stops this process from happening. So people who have a tumor that is caused by making too much HER are given this antibody. This antibody is called Herceptin, H-E-R-C-E-P-T-I-N. Herceptin is a very powerful anti-cancer treatment for those who have tumors caused by HER. And it has a very low level of um, side effects. Very few side effects. So it's an anti-cancer treatment that really doesn't affect the patient very significantly because it works pretty specifically on her. Okay. Questions about that? Yes, back in the bit. His question is, would the side effect of this be that HER wouldn't be present in small amounts, uh, causing this other activation? There will be some side effects as a result of that, and some dosage levels may have to be played with to make this work properly. Yes? Uh, 
Well, if I said, his question is, what does it mean to say low level of cell division? Well, what if 1% of the time it causes a cell to divide? Or what if 1 100th one of the of, uh, percent of the time it caused a cell to divide? That is, it's not always the cause of cell division, but at a low level, it may be stimulating cell division. Well, okay, so you're, you're, okay, so you don't understand. So uh, I'll try to answer your question another way. If I put EGF there, the cell's going to divide. 100% chance, all right? So a 1% chance would mean that 1% of the time, the cell's going to divide if these two come together. That's a much lower likelihood, right? That's what I'm talking about by the percent. Well, why do we even have that as a much bigger question? So I'm not going to go into that. <laughs> okay, these have evolutionary um, uh, origins that I'm not going to talk about. But um, we do have that for a reason. Yes? Yeah, that's a good question. I frequently get asked that. She asked, if, is, is Herceptin a lifetime treatment? Um, I don't believe it is, and I'm not quite sure why it's not. It may be that the immune system adapts and, and takes over, uh, but I, I, I'm not a physician, so I, I, I don't know definitively. Yes, back there. Can her bind EGF? I believe her can bind EGF, but it doesn't have to in order to stimulate this process. Okay. Maybe we should finish with a song today. What do you guys think? It's an old Simon and Garfunkel tune, The Sound of Silence. It's called The Tao of Hormones. Biochemistry, my friend, it's time to study you again. Mechanisms that I need to know are the things that really stress me so. Get these pathways planted firmly in your head, Ahern said. Let's start with epinephrine. Membrane proteins are well known. Change on binding this hormone. Changing cells without pro oh, rearranging cells without protest. <laughs> I can't read my own thing. Stimulating IG alpha S to go open up and displace its GDP with GTP because of epinephrine. Active G then moves away. Stimulating at cyclase, so a bunch of cyclic AMP binds to kinase and then sets it free. All the active sites of the kinases await triphosphate because of epinephrine. Muscles are affected then, breaking down their glycogen, so they get a lot of energy in the form of lots of G1P and the synthases that could make a glucose chain all reframe because of epinephrine. Now I've reached the pathway in, going from adrenaline. Here's a trick I learned to get it right, linking memory to flight or fright. So the mechanism that's the source of anxious fears reappears when I make epinephrine. Okay, see you guys next time.